Oh, turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, before we get into the Word of God, though, I want to share uh, something quick. Like, it, Not everything is always uh, awesome in church and in life and in the world, right? We have stuff going on in Ukraine, um, but within our body, we have uh, Dan Dogera. He went to be with the Lord uh, on Super Bowl Sunday, just for reference. He had a massive heart attack and ended up in Seattle, and his wife went over there with him, and he ended up having like four or five more heart attacks, and the Lord took him home. There's nothing they could do. Um, and the Lord took him home, but Carla's been praising the Lord through it. She's down in California right now um, with some family. She's going to be down there for the next week or so. And as a church, you know, we talk about being a mission-minded church. One of the things I shared, I shared a video this weekend talking about some of the practical ways that we do that. Um, but one of them is we don't keep huge reserves of money as a church. Uh, we want to, we kind of have a baseline of $25,000 as a, a cushion. Uh, but anything above that, we want to leverage that to take care of the flock and, and to reach out to the outer parts of the world. And so, um, I don't know if you know this, but when you die, it costs money to take care of your body. Did anybody know that? I thought you could just grab a body and throw it in the, Carla was, that's what Carla said. She was like, I wanted to just bury him out by the goat out there. But you can't do that, I guess. Yeah, it costs like five to seven thousand dollars to take care of a body. And so uh, as, as a church, we kicked in a couple of thousand dollars to help and make sure that that was taken care of, to take that stress off. Um, our church group is going to be taking care of a lot of her needs. But uh, why I bring it up is just so that you know what's going on in the body. The Word of God tells us when one member rejoices, we all rejoice with it. And when one member hurts or weeps, we all hurt and weep with that member. And so just be praying for Carla. Um, and if the Lord lays anything on your heart uh, to help her, uh, let me know and I can get you in contact with her. So with that, let's pray together and let's get into God's life-giving Word. Lord, we thank you for an incredible day. Lord, I just, my heart for your people and those who are hurting right now, Lord, I have friends in Europe and the questions that they have and our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and our brothers and sisters in Russia and all over, Lord, we just pray that you would be mighty, that you would do things of biblical proportion right now, Lord, just like you showed up in Moses's life and Joshua's life and David's life and Esther's life and Rahab's life and all the apostles' lives. And like you've shown up in our lives before, Lord, we pray that you do a mighty miracle in this world right now, Lord, that you would just exalt yourself and show the world your glory right now, Lord, so that we could just stop looking at each other and all the junk of the world and we just lift our eyes to you. So, Lord, this morning, help that to be us. As we open your word, Lord, help us to lift our eyes to you, that our hearts would not wander this morning, that our minds would not wander this morning, but that we would be captivated with your goodness, your greatness, and your glory. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in a way that's very plain, that we would understand it, and very powerful, that we would change. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews, the book we've been in for the last few weeks, we're actually going to be transitioning into Luke. We're going to be spending uh, six weeks, starting next week, we're going to be spending six weeks in Luke and wrapping up with the resurrection on, guess what day? Easter! It's crazy how it fell, fell into our Bible plan. Brandon and I were talking about, where are we going to go after Hebrews? And I start looking at Luke and I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, six weeks. What is six weeks from now? I start adding it up and it's on Easter. You can't make that stuff up. You can't make that stuff up. So God is good. Um, and we're going to be looking at that on Easter, the resurrection, of course. Uh, but this week we're looking in Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews is all about the superiority of Jesus Christ. Jesus is superior to absolutely everything. He's superior to angels. And if the angels' word proved accurate, remember we looked at this a couple weeks ago, if the angels' word proved accurate and he's superior to the angels, how much more can we trust Jesus' word to be accurate? In fact, he upholds the entire universe by the word of his power. All of his promises are yes and amen. Jesus is superior to everything. Jesus is superior to any experience you can ever have in your life. Jesus is better. And in Hebrews chapter 11, as I told the kids, uh, we see this passage that many people would call the Hall of Faith. And when we think of the Hall of Fame, like my son Oliver said, it's when people do incredible things, right? You don't get into the Hall of Fame for being mediocre. You don't get into the Hall of Fame for being below average. You get into the Hall of Fame for doing things that are so incredibly noteworthy that you have, they, have, they have to memorialize it. They have to talk about it. And the crazy thing is, is it's things that have never been done before. It's things that have never been done before, and I still believe that our God is in the business of doing things that have never been done before. 
Maybe, you know, Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun, but what he's really talking about there is the human grapple, the human struggle. There are new things. There are new exploits for us to go on. God has prepared good works for each of us to walk in. And the question is, is will we step out in faith like these people in the hall of faith did? Or will we settle for mundane, for mediocrity? When I, when I think of Jesus' words in John chapter 10 when he says, I came to give life and to give it abundantly, the thief only comes to rob, kill, and destroy. I want to make sure that I'm not the one settling for robbery, death, and destruction. I want life and life abundantly. Not as a selfish thing. Like, I just want to, I want to, I, don't, I guess maybe selfish. I want to be alive. I don't know if anybody else wants to be alive. I want to be alive. I want to be free. Jesus says, he who the Son says, free is free indeed. Those are the things, and I want to walk closely with my God because I know from personal experience. As I walk closely with God, that's where life is because in God's presence is fullness of joy. And that's where I want to be. And I can pursue everything else. And I'll never grab a hold of anything that compares to a moment with Jesus Christ. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. And so we find th that, that everything is really unlocked by faith, right? Everything is unlocked by faith in our walk with Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are saved by grace, by the grace of God, through what? Through faith. And so faith is what, and we see it here in verse 6, that faith is what pleases God. And without faith, we can't please God. Let's read the first six verses and then let's break it down. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Verse 7, by faith. Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. i got to keep going. By, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Oh. And we're going to keep going a little bit later. But let's break down what this faith is. Faith, the writer of Hebrews says, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In verse 1. It's the substance of things hoped for. Now, here's what I titled my message. I titled it Voices in My Head. Because from the beginning of time, from the beginning of time, Hebrews chapter 1 says that God has spoken in various ways at various times in times past. And now he's spoken through his apostles. He's spoken through his prophets. He's speaking through his people by his spirit. Um... But from the beginning of time, man has gone through life, and they've heard a voice. They've heard the voice of God directing them, moving them. And they have two choices. They either respond to it or they don't respond to it. And, and, and what's crazy is you're crazy if you hear voices in your head if those things don't come true. But, like, God shows up to Moses. He shows up to Joshua. And he says, Joshua, I want you to walk around. I don't want you to, I don't want you to siege the city, besiege the city. I want you to walk around the city. And the walls are going to fall down. Now that could be a crazy notion. If somebody told, if, if somebody said that, Matt, I want you to walk around Super 1 seven times on the last day and it's going to fall down. Now if you did it and it didn't happen, you would be crazy. But you're stepping out in faith. But what happens is, is there's the promise of God before the provision of God. 
And it says, it points out very plainly here in Hebrews chapter 11 um, and verse 7 here. It says, by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, he moved. Of things not yet seen. This is what faith is. It's things not yet seen. It's the child standing on the stage and I'm standing down here saying, I will catch you. I haven't caught you yet. But I will catch you. I haven't caught you. And some children, they're willing to hug it. Because why? They trust. They trust that my promise to them, my word to them, is going to be true. But some don't. And likewise, within our own faith, <clears throat> within our own walk, within our own life, there's some of us that will hear the voice of God, that will read the word of God. This is his voice. And we will either believe it and step out in faith and trust that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. Or we won't. The problem with faith is it puts us in a precarious position. It puts us in a precarious position. Let's start at salvation. When we, especially in Jesus' time, when somebody gave their life to the Lord and was baptized, this was a huge proclamation. That meant they could very well be in prison, that they could very well be killed. This is a huge precarious position. So they're believing, they're stepping out in faith to the point where they say, look, if God isn't real, if heaven isn't real, if he isn't going to catch me, then I've just wasted everything. I've thrown it all away. This is putting ourselves in a precarious position. And we do it over and over. So many of you, I have talked to so many of you that the Lord has moved you from the, the great state of California to here. <laughs> Washington. Washington. How many of you, though, like, you guys, so that you, you were thinking about going to Canada, weren't you? Yeah, you're going to be like some kind of rich high roller in Canada. I remember this story. And then God brought you to Bonner's Ferry to struggle and suffer with us. <laughs> How many stories are like that? Brandon and Lindsay, thinking that the Lord is leading them up here. And he does, and he opens a door for them. And you watch time after time, but people are stepping out in faith. They're selling everything they have. They're moving across the country. And who knows why God's moving people to Bonner's Ferry, but they're stepping out in faith, and it puts you in a precarious position. You're uprooting your kids. You're uprooting all your relationships. And you're trusting that God, and what he's saying, is the best thing for you. I saw, I saw something really good. I took a picture of it this morning that I wanted to read to you guys. Because I thought it really tied in. It, it's a quote by C.S. Lewis. It says this. We are not doubting God will do the best for us. We are wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. <laughs> I wonder if more times than not, it's not so much a lack of faith, it's a fear of the pain between here and there. Look, he points out about Abraham. He says, by faith Abraham, in verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Okay, if we remember back to Genesis as we've been reading it through as a church, Abraham was loaded. He had everything he could ever want, right? Everything he needs and nothing that he doesn't. And all of a sudden, God shows up and speaks to Abraham. So Abraham hears this voice. And he goes, okay, I guess I'm going out. But God didn't tell him where he was going. He just obeyed the voice of the Lord. In fact, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15, if you'll remember, Saul was, um, he was disobedient. He took the spoils of war for himself and he said, well, I was going to sacrifice him to the Lord. Uh, and Samuel says this to Saul in verse 22 and 23 of 1 Samuel 15. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Look, the reality is, is God wants to move us from where we are. And I don't mean this in a monumental sense. I don't, in, not in all circumstances. Like, God may not call you across the country. God may not call you to grab a gun and go to Ukraine right now and go fight Russians. I don't know. But if he does, if he does, maybe even more simple. Maybe the Lord is calling you to do something within your own family, to disciple your children in a different way, to start praying for them every night, to start reading the Bible with them every night. 
Maybe you're in high school and, and you have friends that don't know the Lord and they're really struggling and you know Jesus would help, but, but you're, you're scared to step out because you don't know their response. Look, when we step out in faith, it puts us in a precarious position. Sometimes it ruins relationships. Sometimes it means uprooting your whole life. Sometimes it means that the, the career we've dreamed about might not be what God has for us. That's a difficult thing. Like for me, you know where I really want to be? I want to be in Alaska. Like that, if I could just be straight with everybody, that is like, if I could be anywhere in the world, that's where I want to be. And the Lord has made so clear to me. He's like, at least in this season, Alaska, you can love it. You can go up there and hunt it. But it's not for you right now. Because I've got work for you to do. And, and, and it's hard, though, when we want to do things. Isn't it hard? Am I the only person that has passions like that? Like, I know I'm not because I do counseling with people who say, I gave up all my dreams for you, honey. <laughs> not my wife. I made her dreams come true. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. That was too far. <laughs> if it wasn't true, it would have been too far. <laughs> Faith puts us in a precarious position. And you know what I've noticed? I saw this picture once, and um, it was God, and he's talking with this little child, and he's kneeled down, and he's taking this little teddy bear, this little tiny teddy bear from the child, and the child is just like, no! And he's like, trust me, I have something better for you. He's got this huge teddy bear behind his back. Let me give you another example. Um, sometimes the things that, and I bring this up because of the context that we're dealing with here, Abraham went out without knowing what was going to happen. It hadn't rained on the earth when Noah built the ark. He hadn't seen that this destruction was coming, but God said it is coming, and so he responded to that. Um, God, God's timing, God's timing is not always our timing. Psalm 37, 4 says that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. So I have this story, and I haven't shared it in a long time, so I think it's relevant. Um, I was moose hunting once with Shelly Thompson, you know, Scott Thompson's wife. He's the one that led me to the Lord. And she drew a moose tag, and we're up hunting, and I'm walking along, and I find this giant moose paddle, moose shed, laying on the ground. I pick the thing up, and she goes, oh, that is so cool. And I knew she wanted it. I knew she wanted it. So I strapped it onto my back, and I took it home. And she was so, you could tell, you know when somebody's like visibly disappointed and just like, you could tell they really want it. And she was visibly disappointed, like to the point where, no, I didn't feel guilty at all. Because when I picked it up and I saw that she wanted it, here's what I thought. I thought, I'm going to make this even better for her. And I took it to somebody who does scrimshaw and I had them scrimshaw into the moose antler the Thompsons established 1989 on it. And two months later, I gave it to them on Christmas, and I was over at their house a couple of weeks ago, and there it is, right on the, in the entryway, as you walk in the house. And, and here's my point, is that God sees your heart, and he sees those desires of your heart. Um, but sometimes God is preparing something even better. And if we're being honest and biblical, sometimes that's not in this world. And that's a hard one to come to terms with. Sometimes our health isn't ever going to be again what it was, or what it needs to be to accomplish things that we want to accomplish. But God has prepared a place for us. God, he sees it, and I've seen it enough times in my life and in other people's lives, he sees your eyes light up when you see that moose antler. But he doesn't always give it to you right away. Sometimes he's working and preparing it. And the question is, is will you trust him by faith in that? Do you trust that God is working all things together for good for those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose? God has a purpose for your life. Do you trust that? He, he says, if, he, if he's not a liar, he says, I am working all things together for good. The good, the bad, the ugly, the mundane, the every... I'm working it all together for good in your life. 
And, and you can hunker down and you can, you, you, can, you can hide your head and you can hide under the covers and you can hide under your bed and, and you can stay here on the ledge or you can put yourself in a precarious position and say, you know what, God is going to come through. One way or the other. Look, the Bible is full of it. They didn't write about anything that wasn't spectacular in the Bible. If we go back to the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have Nebuchadnezzar saying, you will bow down to my statue, you will worship my statue. And they say, no, we won't worship your statue. We worship God. And you know what? Our God is able to deliver us, and even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. He's able to. He doesn't always do. And guess what happens? This encrazed king throws them into a blast furnace that's heated up seven times hotter than normal, and they're just standing there, not a hair on their head, singed. That's faith. We don't know the exact result. Abraham didn't know exactly what this land was going to be, but God said, hey, it's going to be better. It's going to be amazing. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to make your descendants as the sand of the sea and the, the stars of the sky. There's not going to be, you're not going to be able to count them. You're not going to be able to number them. And they believed it, and they stepped out in faith. And here's what it says. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the substance. It's our action on God's promises. It's the evidence of things not seen. Look, I can't see God speaking to you, but I can see the evidence of you being obedient to what God says to you. Right? I can see it when you go and you take care of somebody who's just lost their husband or just lost their wife. I can see it when you take somebody out to coffee and you're opening the word of God with them and you're pouring into them. I can see it when you lift your hands and pray and ask God to show up. That's the substance. That's the substance of our belief. It's the action. We believe it and it turns into action. As James says in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead because true faith manifests into works. True faith moves you off the ledge into the precarious position and if God doesn't catch you, your reputation's ruined. You might die. You might lose everything that you ever worked for. You might financially be in ruin. But what if what God says to you is true? And the hall of faith is all about people that heard the voice of God. And they stepped out and they did it, and God did what he said he was going to do. Surprise, surprise. God did it. And more so for us. You know where faith comes from? Where does our faith come from? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Anybody know it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the what? The word of God. So here's, the, here's part of our, our mission as a church is we want to be a church that goes through the Bible every year. We want to be people that are saturated in the Word of God. And it's a difficult discipline, but here's the reality. Here's the reality. As we saturate ourselves in the Word of God, we're listening to God, and our faith is being built because what happens is we see promise of God, provision of God. Pro every page, promise of God, provision of God. We see it through every all these different people's lives, and we're reminded of that, and we're reminded that that same God faithful in other people's lives will be faithful in our life. Promise and provision over and over and over again. And that's why we believe as a church that going through the Bible, and even if you don't get through the whole Bible in a year, I understand that. For me, I'm a slow comprehender. I don't read real good. I, I really don't. I, it takes me time to really process stuff. But being in the Word of God every day is critical for us as Christians because faith comes by hearing and that of the Word of God. Let me tell you this. God gives us so much insight in his word on how to live life well. In how to live life well. The question is, is do we trust it? He tells us how to parent well. Are your kids a total train wreck? Do you want to pull your, like there's times I just want to pull my hair out with my kids. Those same times I'm not doing devotionals with my kids. I'm not spending time in the Word of God with my kids. I'm not disciplining them like God tells me in His Word. And what faith is much more simple than just the quantum huge leaps out into outer space. Faith is taking God at His Word, and when He says, look, if you devote yourself, if you train up your children in the way they should go, when they are older, they, they may depart for a little while, but when they're older, they won't depart from it. He doesn't say how much older that has to be. They can be 85. I don't know. <laughs> don't give up. He tells, he tells me in his word to wash my wife with the word of God. That's what he tells me to do, to, 
to love her, to cherish her. Now, the way I grew up, it was all about me, because I was going to take care of myself. I grew up, it was just things, like we all have things growing up. I'm not going to sit here and make my sob story happen, right? We all have junk that we've overcome. We're more than overcomers through Jesus. He, he radically, he, re, he replaces the things that the locusts have eaten. Like, God, God can do more than that. I don't want to be a victim in my life. I want to be an overcomer. But, but here's the reality is there's things that I went through in life that my default out of that was I was going to take care of myself first. But our self is last. We love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourself. And all of a sudden, as we, as we take God's word by faith, and say, I'm going to wash my wife in the water by the word. You know how simple that can be, guys? Like, you don't have to be a great theologian. A, a, a friend of mine started doing this. He started taking a verse. He would just read a verse, and he would go into his wife's bathroom on her mirror, and he would write that verse every morning before she woke up. A different verse every morning. Look, you don't have to sit there and give her the Hebrew and the Greek for the different words in the Bible. You just pour the verses over I mean, you could start with whatever verse that is. It's really short. It says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. That's a weird verse to write on your wife's mirror. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's much more simple. Faith like a, Remember what Jesus says, faith like a child. It's simple. God says it. We can do it. We can jump out into his arms. Here, here's what I want to I talk about just for a second, though. The power of God's word. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Framed. Anybody in here in construction? Anybody ever build? I used to be a framer. I had a framing crew. Framing is awesome because it puts the skeleton of the house together. Whatever that house is going to be, it gets finished with all sorts of other things, but it is built. And I loved it. We'd come in and in a week you'd go from a foundation to standing up on top of the roof. It's the best part. Every other part is horrible. Stuff and insulation. All that stuff. I don't know how you guys do it. Plumbing. Brent. Thank you, Lord, for plumbers. We see in Genesis chapter 1 that the, the world was framed. God spoke it into existence. The invisible word of God has physical power. Look, we have it written down here, but David says that I have, I have stored your word in my heart. I've hidden it in my heart. That's the invisible word of God, and it's powerful. It's in, it's in my heart. It's central to my entire being, and, and it directs my steps. The word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The invisible word that is stored and hidden in our heart has physical impact. And if we heed it, it gives us the life that we truly all desire. Because does anybody really want to be in a bad marriage? I mean, just by show of hands, anybody like being in a bad marriage? I know you do. I love how sarcastic you are. You're so fun to talk to. We don't. But we think that we can figure it out, and it's that self-reliance, independence, like we'll just figure it out in our own power, even though our parents never even gave us a great example of it. God's word tells us the true way to happiness. Psalm, I think, 145, 15 says, happier are the people whose God is the Lord. Happier are the people whose God is the Lord. Happiness, joy, these are traits. Jesus says in John 15, I want my joy to be in you, that your joy would be full. These are great things. And as we take these by faith, it's incredible what happens. And we have this, I, I, I want to encourage you, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here. I want to encourage you to read chapter 11. It's crazy. It goes through Moses, it goes through Joshua, it goes through all the unnamed people who had it go really well and had it go really badly. And there was these monumental moments and there was moments of misery. But everything in between, all these people were focused on God's promises and God has come through for them. But here's what I want to challenge you. If we want to see God do things that have never been done before, we can't do things the way that we've always done them. We can't do things the way that they've always been done. And I'm not saying change for the sake of change. I'm saying, what if, we're, what if we were this people that were in tune with this voice? That we're in tune, not, I, and I want to be careful because the Spirit of God is never going to contradict the Word of God, okay? These two things go together. That's why we have the Word of God. It's living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. But what if we heeded this voice? 
What if that prompting of the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19, I don't remember what verse it is, Elijah's out there and he's having a pity party for himself in the middle of nowhere. Elijah was this prophet that had these incredible things happen, called down fire from heaven, just like insane. And then he's having a pity party like we all do, and he's out there, and he's like, God, I'm the only one who's left, and God shows up. And, and there's this massive fire, and this earthquake, and there's this windstorm, and then it says, and then there was this still, small voice. A still, small voice. And there's this voice. I believe that every one of us has heard it. Whether we recognize it or yield to it or not, we've all heard this still, small voice. And it's that prompting, that prompting of the Holy Spirit when he says, hey, look at that person over there. You could be my hands. You could be my feet. That's the invisible word of God having physical power when we take it and obey it. That voice. What if we started, what if we started listening to that voice a little more? What if as we saw things come up and opportunities to serve God come up, we said, you know what, I could do that. Are you speaking to me, God? You're talking to me. <laughs> but yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. How cool would that be? Look, I don't know if walls are going to fall down. I believe they will. I've seen it happen in relationships with my own dad. Such a wall in our relationship. And I, I watched the movie, I Can Only Imagine. You guys ever watch that? Yeah, if you watch that and you're not convicted to go try and reconcile a relationship, you're not saved. Um, yeah, that's the truth. You guys want the truth. Nothing but the truth, so help me God. Um, I cried like a baby through that whole movie. I get out, I'm like, Dad, I'm coming to see you! You're staying here, I'm coming to you! And I went out there and I was going to tell my dad how he'd done all these things wrong. And I got out there and the Lord just was like, so you want this guy to be mastered by me and you don't want to show him what it looks to be mastered by me? And so for five days, I just spent time with my dad. And then finally, instead of telling him all the things he did wrong, I started asking forgiveness for the things that I had done wrong as a son. And he starts weeping and pulls over to the side of the road and he starts asking forgiveness for things. And I'm telling you right then and there, boom, wall fell down. And it didn't have, yeah, amen, huh? Dude, it is not just for Joshua. Seas parted, ways opening up that weren't there before. Like, that happens when we trust God. When we deal with our differences, when we ask for forgiveness, when we go that extra mile. And we have to do it by faith because we're putting ourselves in a precarious position. If I ask my dad's forgiveness and he said, well, yeah, I knew that all along. You were a piece of junk son. Imagine the hurt. Like the real hurt. You guys know this. You all, we all know this. If somebody shuts you, if you put your heart out there on the line and somebody goes, ha, 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 got you, weakling. That's hurt. You, but you know what? God tells me that I need to forgive my brother. God tells me that I need to reconcile. As much as it depends on me, I need to be at peace. These are things that, these are practical. I'm just trying to give you practical ways that we step out in faith and practical ways that I have seen God knock down walls. And it will happen if we step out in faith, my friends. So my challenge, and if the worship team wants to come back up, man, as we hear that voice, maybe God's prompting you right now even to go reconcile with somebody. Maybe God's asking you to do something incredible. And he's saying, hey, I want you to go over and help alongside Samaritan's Purse as they help the refugees in Ukraine right now. I don't know if, somebody, if God's telling you that. Maybe he's saying, hey, hey, Joey, I want you to be in Celebrate Recovery. No. Well, you've already, you've already yielded to that. I don't know what he's asking John. I don't know what he's asking Phil. I don't know what he's asking Pat. I don't know, but I do know that God is speaking to each and every one of us right now. And what if we stepped out in faith and just did it? And stopped worrying about all the consequences and let God sort out the details? What if we just do it and let God sort out the details? Out of faith. Leap out there. Because you know what? We're here and God is out here and it says it is impossible to please God without faith. You know why? Because he wants us right where he is. And there's this chasm between us and all we got to do is jump. Lord, 
Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. And I pray for your power in, upon, and among your people. Lord, God, direct us. Use us mightily. And I pray that you would just be glorified as we worship you during these last couple songs. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.